Hello, everyone. I'm Robin Houlihan, Senior Philanthropic Director at Foundation Source, the nation's largest provider of comprehensive support services for private foundations. I am delighted to welcome all of our listeners to this session and to be speaking with Abigail Selden, CEO of the Selden Herring Smith Foundation, which focuses on access to public services and accountability for abuse of authority. Our discussion today will focus on the work of this modest sized foundation that delivers big impact with creative solutions to tackle tough issues. Welcome, Abigail. The Selden Herring Smith Foundation was established recently in 2019. Did you start this foundation already knowing what you wanted to accomplish? And could you describe your process in defining the foundation's mission, its program goals, and focus areas. Thanks, Robin, and it's a pleasure to be here with you for this webinar. This is great fun. Uh, so when we started the foundation, we knew we wanted to catalyze change in slow-moving sectors that we viewed as central to social justice in the United States, particularly higher education and immigrant rights. We, didn't, we knew we didn't want to see new organizations. We wanted to shift existing power centers and public conversation. Our core topics were originally higher ed and, and immigration, because in 2019, when we started, we viewed the abuses in the immigration space to be a national emergency. Um, by contrast, higher education had been a focus of mine for the previous decade, and I had founded, built, and sold a company in that industry. So we know now, of course, looking back, that the actual buckets are not immigration and higher ed, but actually access to public services and accountability for abuse of authority. It just so happens that we do work in immigration and higher ed around those themes, but it took a lot of trial and error to be able to define it that clearly and cleanly. Mm -hmm. I would say a lot of the how, in terms of how we operate the foundation, emerged from my past experiences in philanthropy and in advocacy. You know, in many ways, we have been building the organization that I wished existed earlier in my own career. Even so, and even with all of that background knowledge, it took us two years of operating the foundation to really fill in the details and generate a clear mission statement that can make sense both externally and internally for our team. I realized that in this process of discovery and definition, foundations often have a certain preferences in their giving, such as the size of the grant and grantee organizations and the role that the funder wants to play in supporting efforts towards solutions. So as a modest sized foundation seeking to address some, some large scale societal issues, where does the Selding Herring Smith Foundation, or I'll say SHSF, find its sweet spot? How does the foundation's giving preferences fit best with its goals and size? So SHSF makes grants, we also incubate initiatives, and we pursue independent research. And we really view these multiple approaches as being central to how we engage the issues we care about, given our size. Um, for our grant making specifically, I know we'll talk about some of the other aspects of our work later in the conversation, but for our grant making specifically, we look for opportunities in particular to change the public's conversation around a topic or the opportunity to generate high impact outcomes. So our grants typically range from $5,000 to $25,000 to meet the needs of a specific project. So we fund either an initial project stage or a one-time research initiative or activity. Um, and typically we process those grants and typically those grants run, I should say, for three to six months at most from inception to delivery of the product that um, is part of the grant. We move the process along through a brief application that we directly solicit. We've previously tried open application processes, but we actually found that it didn't generate anything actionable for us. And we felt bad that it was putting a time tax on other organizations that were applying in good faith. Uh, one, of, one central feature though of how we work in line with that is that we try to keep our relationships low touch. We know that at the grant level that we're making, we are a very small part of many organizations' budgets. So we really don't wanna take up a lot of their time through this process. At the same time, our interactions have, with our grantees have become more formal over time and more formalized. 
Um, so while we do value this low touch orientation, we found that that's sometimes misinterpreted by organizations. And so we have had discussions with prominent organizations that didn't bother to return our calls or fill out our basic form when we were offering funding and others who felt that we were small potatoes and didn't deliver on all of our grant requirements. So we've tried to find that balance now with all of this learning under our belts between being low, low touch and light touch, but being really formal and clear about the expectations we do have at the beginning of any engagement. Among the foundation's multiple approaches, you mentioned using research as a tool to address your mission. Could you share a few examples when you funded research to learn about and then address a problem that's larger than a foundation can typically solve on its own? Sure. Um, you know, one theme in particular comes to mind in our work. So one population that we think a lot about and that we focus a lot of our work on are today's college students. So students today are often older than 22 and many have families of their own. One in four is a parent to a minor child. And so while, and at the same time, even while the overwhelming majority of today's college students hold jobs or did before the pandemic, more than half struggle with food and housing insecurity while they're in school. So we think a lot about this population and a number of our grants have focused on how to advance um, how to advance this population. In 2019, we gave a grant to the Hope Center for College Community and Justice at Temple University, which is a leading research organization on college students and basic needs. Their annual real college survey and outstanding communication work has built awareness of the demographics of food and housing insecurity among college students. And so given their data and their networks and their expertise, we asked them to look into what students were spending on childcare and on the rates of food and housing insecurity among student parents. And that project we thought of as being a great success, both because it did generate those numbers, which were not terribly uplifting. Struggling student parents do spend a lot of money on child care and are disproportionately food and housing insecure. But because we did it with the Hope Center, they not only were able to generate those numbers, they were able to bring them to the public conversation and really help change the discussions around how we work with student parents in college. Um, another example from, from a different part of our portfolio, um, following the deployment of militarized po federal police in Portland in the summer of 2020, which seems like a long time ago now, um, we funded the Public Rights Project to provide support for a coalition of cities to explore possible legal theories to stop federal encroachment and overreach into their jurisdictions. Again, I know it's a long time ago, but at the time that was a very scary moment for a lot of cities. And so what this project included was rapid response support to help cities challenge the federal government's efforts to undermine local civic engagement and to foment, to foment violence. The Public Rights Project was a really good fit for this because they're a phenomenal organization that actually places fellows inside the offices of attorneys general and district attorneys. So they were well placed both to do the research and to ensure its dissemination quickly to the people who needed it most. So with these examples, it sounds like you're supporting research as a tool to find new solutions to systemic or long-term problems. Does the foundation only support grantee research or do you do this internally as well? Yes, we do. We do perform research internally. Typically, our internal research projects are more interdisciplinary or more technical than what we could fund a single organization to pursue with a grant. So our model now is to bring on research fellows who are typically graduate students or recent PhDs to lead a project for three or six months. Our, one of our more recent projects produced an interactive map and report about transit accessibility of colleges and universities inside the United States. So transit access is a big barrier to success for today's college students, especially for students at community colleges but before we built this map, there were no guiding statistics or maps to define the issue. You know, people in the field knew about it anecdotally, either from a single college's experience or a student's experience, but we had no bird's eye view of the field. So we wanted to answer this question, do you need to own a car to attend community college? It turns out only 57% of community colleges are currently transit accessible. 
But what's really interesting is that we found an additional 25% could be made accessible through really low cost investments in extending existing bus lines. The resulting interactive map and report, which I know we'll be able to show on the screen um, in a minute, is influencing policymakers at both the state and national levels, but the construction of it and the research behind it required a cross-functional team that just isn't standard at most think tanks or colleges. So we saw the need for this work at the beginning of this year, and we were able to assemble the team and launch the interactive map in time to educate policymakers engaged in the infrastructure discussions that are now underway in Washington. Are there other ways in which you go beyond grant making to make greater impact? So we have built a number of direct charitable activities or DCAs beyond the interactive transit map, largely by partnering with external companies that have technical expertise. So one of my pet peeves is when the nonprofit sector reinvents the wheel rather than partnering with a company that will lend us the wheel or license us the wheel. So one example of this is that, again, an enduring problem that I think is holding back higher education reform is the misperception of who today's students are in college. You know, many people perceive college, today's college students as being largely middle class, 18 to 22 years old, living on residential campuses. And that's pretty far from the truth for most of the students in college today. So we partnered with Getty Images to produce new stock images of student parents who represent one in four of today's college students, as well as to other populations of students missing from current stock photo libraries. Now we spent less than $40,000 on this project, including our spending with Getty and on media outreach and web design. But the impact is really far reaching. We are already seeing the photos being used in mainstream publications. And I think of this kind of project as being a good one that can be replicated by any small foundation seeking to change perceptions on a particular issue. And you know, as you said, you know, also an option available to foundations of our size. In order to make progress, your foundation is choosing to tackle some challenging, high-profile topics and research with no guaranteed conclusions. These types of giving may appear to carry a certain element of risk. Can you talk a bit about the foundation's tolerance for risk? And given its interest in seed funding and research efforts, what have you learned from your experiences? So absolutely all of the choices that we're making certainly carry a degree of risk. Um, one of the things we think a lot about and we say a lot is that we're comfortable with failure, but we're not comfortable with incrementalism. So we are actually shooting as a foundation for a barbell shaped set of outcomes where some projects are gonna fail completely, but they were worth a shot. And others are gonna have really outsized impact, you know, in influencing policymakers on infrastructure, front page news in USA Today. And so obviously some will still land in the middle, but our goal is to really generate those barbell outcomes. So, you know, what does that mean in practice? It means in practice, we have funded projects that didn't work. For example, we have sponsored a number of organizations to look at how states could assert jurisdiction over federal facilities that were abusing children held in immigration detention. At least one of those grants was a total dead end. Grantee sent us a research brief, which explored a legal theory that they concluded was not workable. We also funded a think tank to look at another aspect of that issue, which did offer more viable paths forward, but then we saw very limited interest and engagement from state officials and from the media in pursuing those paths. So, you know, I'm very glad we tried on those topics. And fortunately, other parts of our portfolio, looking at children in immigration detention, were more successful than that. But Sometimes when you shoot at the moon, you miss. Um, at the same time, we have invested in some wildly successful projects that others wrote off as too risky or uncertain. So this is the other end of the barbell. So our recent report on sex trafficking in higher education was featured on the front page of USA Today this July, and it has already sparked state and federal investigations. We launched this project by bringing on a research fellow but we had originally tried to fund external organizations to research the topic. But back in 2019, when we were seeking a grantee for this, there were no results in any Google search on the topic. The project was, com the concept was completely unknown. And so no organization was willing to take it on. And so we had to do it internally. And obviously I'm very glad we did. It's great to see, to see the sea change on that topic. 
but it was a high risk proposition. Yeah. I want to tie back to your discussion earlier on how you developed your mission, partly through a learning process and engaging in research. So given your interest in understanding the nature of a problem before tackling solutions, how do you learn the outcomes or the impact of your grant making? That's a great question. Um, we think a lot about that. You know, certainly because of the size of our foundation and the size of the grants we make, not burdening the grantee is a key tenant of how we engage. You know, we at the same time do want to understand their results. So what we have decided to do is in lieu of interim reports, we actually set up a monthly call with our grantees during the active period of the grant to check in and understand how the project's going and to learn from them as they go. But we don't require a written update en route to the completion of the grant. And at the close of the grant, we don't ask for a formal evaluation or any kind of write-up. What we ask them to do is to actually write an opinion essay about their project and make a good faith effort to place it in external publication. So you make some important process decisions here. First, you determine an evaluation method that considers resources, both the foundations and the grantees. And second, your evaluation objective is not only to use it as a tool for the foundation to learn, but also as a tool to, to support the grantee. Um, has there been anything that has surprised you about the results of your work? Have there been situations that you were not prepared for or perhaps outcomes that went beyond what was expected? Absolutely. You know, this whole, I think, journey is running any organization is a learning process. Running a startup foundation absolutely has featured a lot of learning and a lot of evolution of our products and projects and processes. Um, you know, for example, we have absolutely given grants and then seen really lackluster communications engagement from the grantees. So not all organizations are set up to advocate for their own work. And we have found that making an explicit grant requirement around it doesn't always solve the problem. And this has been a particular issue, I would say, with making small grants to large think tanks. And that was something I was surprised by. I did not expect it. I had thought that making it a requirement would solve the issue on its own. And it's turned out that we've needed to communicate those expectations also throughout our monthly calls to reaffirm that we really do mean it, that they have to be focused on promoting the outcome. And also that we sometimes have to wrap some additional communication support around the grantee to ensure distribution of their work. Um, at the same time though, one of our most successful grants last year was to the Education Trust for an issue brief about racial equity in college financial aid awards. The authors did a phenomenal job both writing and disseminating the brief, and it's now won an award and also inspired a toolkit on implicit bias at one of the most important industry associations. So we have also seen cases where the communications orientation really matches up with the grantee's own motivation for doing the work, and that contributes immeasurably to having a good outcome, not just a quality of work, but in that work actually moving out into the world and making a difference. I want to shift for just a minute to acknowledge that we have certainly been experiencing some challenging times. How has your foundation's work been affected by this? So SHSF has actually gone through a large growth period during the pandemic. You know, I think that without the distractions of some meetings in real life and conferences, that really provided us with extra time to think about and crystallize our thinking around the pillars of our organization. We were already, our small team was already distributed, working through Zoom and phone and Slack and email. So our processes with our teammates didn't really change. The pandemic also provided rocket fuel for one of our initiatives. So just three weeks after the pandemic, we actually launched Swift Student, which is a free website that helps college students ask for additional financial aid. We partnered with 18 leading higher ed organizations to build the free website, and then it went live just as students around the country were falling into financial crisis and being sent home during the COVID-19 shutdown, the first one. Um, so we had been working on this project, though, for Swift Student for six months. It wasn't built custom to support students struggling during the pandemic, but we and the other organizations that we collaborated with 
knew that students were struggling financially prior to COVID-19 and also that many students did not know that they could ask their schools for additional financial aid. So COVID you know, and all of the things associated with COVID have really revealed the struggle that the student population faces and made it public. And as a foundation, you know, we were really grateful that we had SWIFT student ready to go at the right place and the right time to make a difference. Your work is certainly teaching us that the unexpected or the unplanned can have important impact. I want to circle back to some things you said earlier about using communications as a tool for evaluation and for building awareness on your work. For example, that recent USA Today article. Can you talk more about how communications plays a role in accomplishing your goals? Absolutely. So we view media and communications as an essential function of our foundation. You know, ultimately what we're seeking as most foundations I think are seeking is change at scale. And without news coverage and advocacy, our work and the work of our grantees will not shape or impact the future. So we have a media strategy for all of our projects. And as I mentioned, our grantees are required to author an opinion piece and try to place it. Um, we achieve this by retaining outside advisors and candidly it's a very large percentage of my time. The USA Today front page story and the media coverage of the interactive college transit map, you know, we've been really pleased to see drive policy change and public conversation. But great ideas, you know, we think pop up every day in every organization. It's really only the ones that are heard or publicized that are gonna change institutional priorities or change government priorities. So as odd as it is to say, and if you'd asked me before the pandemic, I would have thought differently, but social media has been a big focus for us. Uh, visibility and public discussions with experts and organizations continues to ensure that our work and the work of our grantees can influence outcomes. Uh, you know, we took the whole thing very ser so seriously, in fact, that my background, not this one, um, got a nine out of 10 on Room Raider. So that was a entertaining, right. fun part of the pandemic for us as well. Um, certainly, we still have a lot of room to grow. For example, we'd love to be more engaged with other family foundations and find ways to work together, but we're still getting to know that landscape in this sphere. Can you talk a bit more about engaging with others in the philanthropic and programmatic field? For example, with donors and subject matter experts. From what I can see, your foundation does not operate in a silo. We try not to. Um, so I know that informational interviews are very popular right now, and I've seen a lot of uh, materials come out around that. Um, that's actually not our go-to mode. We try to keep these to a minimum. You know, most organizations, and I remember this from being on the other side of the table, you know, assume that attention from a funder means a possible future grant. And at SHSF, we never want to create that impression unless the organization is actively under consideration. Um, so what do we do instead? So we voraciously swallow industry periodicals for a lot of our higher ed work, the Chronicle of Higher Education and Open Campus Media have been big resources. We attend a lot of webinars run by other organizations on relevant topics. Um, we also keep track of a lot of activity on Twitter. You know, we often find out developments in the field there rather than from press releases or formal newsletters, which can be very sanitized and not terribly helpful as you're trying to learn a new area. How about joining forces with other donors to make change happen? So our grant process is very fast, which can make collaboration challenging. Sometimes we've made grants as quick as 36 to 72 hours from an initial conversation with a grantee to actual fund disbursement. So we have only done one true joint grant project to date with another foundation. We have been very excited though to see other national foundations with greater resources than ours sign on to fund the expansion of our seed projects. So for example, last year, the Kresge Foundation signed on to fund the expansion of a toolkit that we had funded at the Institute for Women's Policy Research about how to bring Head Start sites onto college campuses. Recently, the Gates Foundation and Imaginable Futures funded additional multiple years of research by the HOPE Center for College Community and Justice to continue the work that we had originally funded about student parents. The Public Rights Project Coalition for Cities 
attracted a number of new funders, both national and family foundations, after we had provided the seed capital. And we see this as, we're grateful to say, a continuing theme in some of our more successful projects. And in early 2022, we expect to share news of another national foundation building on our transit work. So we're really proud of our record of triggering larger investments from national foundations and ultimately government action in a number of cases. And I really view this as being a special opportunity for family foundations, since we can absorb the risk and can also highlight successes to our networks. So we're really pleased to see this experimental approach, you know, bear fruit and bear fruit so quickly. It's really good to hear. You facilitated positive outcomes in some trying times. Um, your accomplishments in such a short period have been extraordinary. We have a lot to take away from this conversation. Um, just to, to recap a bit, small foundations can have a big impact by being creative with resources, uh, in this case, focusing on research and communications initiatives, for example. Um, also, rate of success can be significant in incubating projects with seed or early stage support. Uh, they can trigger larger investments from others. And you talked about low touch relationships with small grantees that can maximize an efficient use of resources for everyone. Um, and finally, going beyond grant making, you're partnering with companies, for example, that helps ensure that you're catalyzing change. So Abigail, I realize we've covered a lot of ground here, but would you like to leave our listeners with one final thought? Sure. Well, and first, thank you, Robin, for this opportunity. It's great to be here with you. And certainly Foundation Source is a critical component of what we're doing every day. Um, so I guess it would be sort of two thoughts. One is that, you know, we've been really privileged, I think, to end up with great partners at SHSF. And that's been a critical component, I think, of what we've been able to do in the last two years. And the second is that, you know, we have found that the risk taking has kept us engaged and kept us hopeful about this period of time where there is so much change and so much trouble. And I, I would encourage others to take a shot at it. It's been, I think, fun and ultimately very rewarding to see some of these higher risk projects go forward. Thank you, Abigail. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. This has been a very informative and enlightening conversation. Thank you.